Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on a wet day from rain in Washington instead of the normal humid summer. It's coming down in buckets in some cases. We do appreciate you joining us here at the Heritage Foundation. I'm John Hilbolt, Director of Lectures and Seminars. It's my privilege to welcome you to our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium and, of course, to welcome those who join us on each occasion on our Heritage.org website. Uh, we would ask those in-house if they'd make that last-minute check that cell phones have been turned off. And we, of course, remind our Internet viewers that questions or comments can be addressed to us at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. <coughs> Uh, we will post the program within 24 hours on our website for everyone's future reference. Hosting our discussion this morning is Dr. Lee Edwards. Dr. Edwards is widely regarded as a historian of the American conservative movement. He serves here at Heritage as the Distinguished Fellow in Conservative Thought, part of our B. Kenneth Simon Center for American Studies. He also serves as chairman of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation and as an adjunct professor of politics at Catholic University of America. He is the author or editor of 20 books, including histories not only of heritage, but of ISI, the Insti Intercollegiate Studies Institute, as well as biographies of Ronald Reagan, Barry Goldwater, and Edwin Meese. Previously served as the founding director of the Institute on Political Journalism at Georgetown University, as well as having been a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Dr. Lee Edwards. Lee? Well, thank you, John, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Heritage Foundation. for a discussion of a truly remarkable man. Uh, Whitaker Chambers was one of the most influential conservatives of the last half of the 20th century. Uh, William F. Buckley described him as the most important American defector from communism. Uh, Chambers' magisterial autobiography, Witness, deeply influenced some of the most important conservatives of the 20th century, including President Ronald Reagan, who 30 years after reading it could recite the opening pages of the first chapter over and over again if necessary. Uh, Tony Dolan tells this story when he was first in the Oval Office and mentioned, have you, do you know about witness? And the president began reciting from memory the first pages of a letter to my children. Uh, Chambers' most famous political act came in August of 1948 at a congressional hearing uh, when he identified Alger Hiss, a golden boy of the liberal establishment, as a fellow member of his underground communist cell in the 1930s, and Hiss quickly denied Chambers' allegation. A great deal more than the reputations of these two men was at stake if Hiss was innocent anti-communism and the careers of those closely associated with that crusade, like Richard Nixon, a member of the Congressional Investigating Committee, would be dealt a deadly blow. If Hiss was guilty, um, anti-communism would become a permanent part of the political landscape and its spokesmen would become national leaders. Well, after two protracted trials, Hiss was convicted of perjury for denying his espionage activities, a sentence to five years in jail. In the mid-1990s, the Venona transcripts of secret KGB and GRU messages during World War II confirmed that Alger Hiss had been a Soviet spy not only in the 1930s, but at least until 1945. Chambers continued to play a prominent role in American conservatism till his death in 1961, uh, serving as a senior editor at National Review, uh, writing a devastating review of Ayn Rand's gargantuan novel, Atlas Shrugged, and urging the editor of Time magazine, of which he himself had been a senior editor, to devote its entire book section to a review of what he called one of the most important books he had read in a long time. The book, Russell Kirk's The Conservative Mind. Publisher Henry Regnery never forgot his sense of exultation when the long laudatory time review arrived. Well, what 
and who influenced Whitaker Chambers' thinking and writing? Is he a modern-day St. Augustine? What relevance, relevance has he in today's internet world in which communism, for most people, seems only a bad dream? We're indebted to Richard Reinsch for answering these and other critical questions in a superb intellectual biography entitled Whitaker Chambers, The Spirit of a Counter-Revolutionary. In an interview with Catherine Lopez of National Review Online, Mr. Reinsch was asked how a policymaker or candidate could benefit from his book today. And he answered, well, how can you govern if you don't know the men and ideas that profoundly shaped our present? If you want to understand the follies of planning, then you should read Hayek, of course, but also Whitaker Chambers. Richard Reinsch is the program officer at Liberty Fund, writes for such publications as Modern Age, National Review, City Journal. He earned his JD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and now lives near Indianapolis. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the author of Whitaker Chambers, The Spirit of a Counter-Revolutionary, Richard Reich. Well, it is wonderful to be here today at the Heritage Foundation to talk about Whitaker Chambers and to talk about his ideas and his witness. Um, this book really began uh, with the idea to take Chambers at his own words when he says in the opening pages of Witness, if what I have to say and what I have done only concerns espionage, only concerns betrayal, only concerns spycraft, then it's really of limited value. It has no enduring contribution to make to America, to our politics, to our understanding of liberty, to our understanding of the human person. And so before getting into his, to his ideas, which you know, Lee has provided some historical background. You know, let's understand the moment that he's called into in 1948. In 1946, the Republican Party has largely resurrected itself. It's come back to take control of the Congress. And by virtue of that, it now holds the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Richard Nixon is a freshman congressman from California, a Republican, who is placed on this committee by no means a plum assignment. And Chambers is brought in. He's subpoenaed to testify uh, in August of 1948 in large measure to corroborate the testimony of Elizabeth Bentley, the so-called blonde spy queen. She had given 80 names, uh, but, uh, and now while we know archival research has confirmed her claims, um, she's largely seen as a less than coherent, credible witness for certain reasons, and they look to Chambers to come in and substantiate what she's done, and, and he does. So imagine a disheveled, eccentric, if not brilliant journalist who writes for one of the most you know, the foremost uh, publications in the English-speaking world, Time Magazine, who comes in and testifies to the House Committee of intricate communist activity that had happened within the federal government uh, for seemingly, uh, for over a decade. Of the 21 names Whitaker Chambers provides, many of them personify the progressive movement's understanding of government service and administration. Indeed, in the case of Alger Hiss, uh, it was difficult for many to even contemplate that he could have had this dual allegiance because of his resume, his qualifications, his ideals, and years stretching back really to the beginning of the New Deal of patriotic service to the country. And I should include many on the committee itself, on the House Committee of Un-American Activities, also doubted Chambers. The one exception, as we've noted, is Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon is one who has largely studied this matter independently. He's been in conversations with a Catholic priest, Father John Cronin of the Catholic Social Welfare Conference. And Cronin has informed Nixon of his, his ideological activities. He would know uh, he was being given FBI files to largely keep the Catholic Church clued in to communist activity in this country. So Chambers, a man who had been a dropout in several ways in life, one who had betrayed his country, betrayed his wife, who insisted that day in speaking in front of the House Committee and speaking in almost apocalyptic tones about his reasons for testifying. Uh, so Chambers' pessimism comes quite early, I think, it stays with him. He's also, physically speaking, he's short, he's squat. That day he's dressed in a, a suit, many thought was a funeral costume. And if you compare this to Alger Hiss, Alger Hiss is well-manicured, uh, he's, he's well-spoken, uh, 
he looks and comes across much better that day. And indeed, uh, Chambers gives a very powerful testimony, but it's Hiss's testimony that is perhaps uh, one that turns the tables. Chambers, however, as, as, we, as I discussed, Chambers' testimony that day will largely seal the fate of Alger Hiss. He never really maneuvers out from underneath uh, Chambers' words. So Chambers' testimony that day, and then his writings, I would argue, forced one of the most tragic divisions, one of the deepest divisions in our nation's politics, and dealt the New Deal a tremendous blow. Dealt the New Deal consensus, I should say, a tremendous blow. Moreover, in his willingness to immolate himself, I would argue Chambers telegraphed to America the resolve that would be needed to achieve victory in the age of ideological falsehood. Emanating from Chambers' witness was the warning that America's progressive rulers were perhaps politically unable to form and maintain that commitment. Now, we can, we can argue about that. That might be an unfair charge. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest, particularly in the Truman administration, that perhaps it was. But nevertheless, it's a charge Chambers leveled. I believe Chambers' witnesses recreate the opportunity for the recovery of self-government in our country. And Chambers' conversion from that most modern of intellectual diseases, communism, his acceptance of Christianity, and his resolute defense of this nation in the early Cold War period. He provides perhaps the best path to liberty in the age of armed ideology. His negative witness against Alger Hiss, against Soviet communism, against the exuberant confidence and planning displayed by New Deal era progressives, and alternatively, his positive witness for liberty and truth, his positive witness, his affirming of man's need of the transcendent, and indeed, forging the ground of self-government again in our country would also bring together a disparate conservatism. Chambers stands almost alone in his contention at that time that communism had to be rejected in the name of something other than modern liberalism. Related to this proposition was Chambers' counsel that political freedom must be independently grounded in God, the soul, and the irreducible dignity of the human person or as Chambers termed it, the biblical understanding of man. As he stated, quote, political freedom as the Western world has known it is only a political reading of the Bible, end quote. These propositions make Whitaker Chambers a figure troubling, if not dangerous to the left, but also spark the consternation of many on the American right as well. Chambers' understanding of politics and power was rooted in his understanding of man's liberty and its foundation in God. He elucidated the pre-modern understanding of liberty as being intimately related to the discovery of truth. The implication of this freedom is that man is able, however incompletely, to know the truth about his being. As Chambers held, quote, freedom is a need of the soul and nothing else. It is in striving toward God that the soul strives continually after a condition of freedom. God alone is the inciter and guarantor of freedom. He is the only guarantor. External freedom is only an aspect of interior freedom. Religion and freedom are indivisible. Without freedom, the soul dies. Without the soul, there is no justification for freedom. Chambers argued that liberty had been perverted by the modern philosophical project because it was now being tied to the masterful realization of self-sovereignty. In this view, nothing exists above the human will that can provide guidance and direction to liberty. Man chooses, consents to, and creates his own reality. Moreover, when Chambers stated in the passage above, in striving towards God, the soul strives continually after a condition of freedom, he means that we realize our freedom most clearly when we begin to understand the limitations and agonies of our composite being. Anxiety and angst accompany the human person who realizes his similarities with the animals, but who also possesses through reason and imagination the desire to mount higher. Accordingly for Chambers, this desire for transcendence was never more evident than in the dialectical unfolding of positivist rationalism. Rather than finding his liberation in the hyper-rationalism that undergirded much of modern thought, more than ever, man now began to seek an ideological salve for his anxiety. Men, Chambers stated, quote, will break new paths, though they must break their hearts to do it, end quote. Ideology allowed men to, quote, burst out somewhere, even if such bursting out takes the form of an aberration. For to act an aberration is more like living than to die of futility. 
or even to live in that complacency, which is futility's idiot twin, end quote. Reversing the triumphalism of modern liberalism, Chambers articulated that liberty had been slowly undermined by the continental enlightenment's geometric confidence, confidence in man's reason. Chambers articulated that the effectual truth of the enlightenment was communism. He stated, the communist party is quite justified in calling itself the most revolutionary party in history. It has posed in practical form the most revolutionary question in history, God or man. It has taken the logical next step which 300 years of rationalism hesitated to take and said what millions of modern minds think but do not dare or care to say. If man's mind is the decisive force in the world, what need is there for God? Henceforth, man's mind is man's fate, end quote. So we now, I think, can begin to understand Chambers' famous pessimism, his famous statement that he records on the opening page of Witness that he, that he made to his wife upon exiting from his covert role in Soviet military intelligence. You know we are leaving the winning world for the losing world, end quote. Obviously, in retrospect, Chambers overlooked the reserves of liberty and spontaneity still present in Western democracies. I think there was also a certain failure on Chambers' part to really grasp the full superiority of markets over planned economies. But Chambers was not alone in these failures. Many, many made them. Joseph Schumpeter, to, to say one. So Chambers outlined in Cold Friday, which is a posthumously published text, in many ways deeper than Witness, where he really begins to wrestle with the implications of his pessimism and what he has said. He outlines three options for the West. The first option was defeat. The second option, and the one that I think was more likely in his mind, was political victory, but one that was largely inconsequential. Because in many respects, to win under this, in, in this rationale, the West would become brother enemy. We would assume the philosophical imprint of communism. We would assume their atheist humanism. He did not find that to be a very rosy scenario. So the third option, and the one he thought the least likely, was victory, but victory through religious and moral recovery of the foundations of Western civilization. This religious and moral excellence, which Alexander Solzhenitsyn had termed the, the reserves of mercy and limitation uh, uh, emanating throughout the Christian centuries would be, I think, what Chambers was talking about. I think a particular episode in his life illuminates this, this rather tragic understanding he has. In November of 52, he falls victim to a heart attack after voting. He's taken to a hospital in Baltimore, and he becomes uh, close friends with the chaplain, who was a passionist monk named Father Allen. And Chambers asked Allen, he records, was I too foreboding? Was I, was I too... Uh, was it too strong to say that, uh, that the West would lose? And the monk's response was quite revealing, uh, and one that Chambers talks about at length. He, the monk says, who says that the West deserves to be saved? I think implicit in this response is that nothing was guaranteed to the West if it continued in jettisoning its foundational truths. To deserve to be saved would entail fidelity, responsibility to the ideas and habits of being that had made the West the civilization of liberty and mercy it had formerly been. At this point, Father Allen suggested to Chambers, the West's distinctiveness was nearly lost. Chambers' pessimism was rooted in his belief that the West had adopted a materialism comparable in many respects to the intrinsic workings of communist ideology and was unable to engage in the deep moral and metaphysical reflection necessary to renew itself. He, and he searched in Cold Friday for the sources of communion for the West, what it might offer the enslaved peoples in Eastern Europe. And he didn't find much. He thought the West was paralyzed and unable to hope or move forward. Its communion, Chambers said, and the objects of its loves no longer inspired. Regardless of politics, regardless of being right or left in the West, Chambers observed that the West's soaring confidence was really in the positivist mind which strangely connected it, Chambers thought, to its communist foe. Lost in this modern translation of man, which insisted on perfection through science and technology, power and control, was man has the tragic and limited being who sits uncomfortably between two eternities. The West remained unable to question its philosophic materialism. Chambers saw man differently. Chambers saw man has a complex arrangement of misery and greatness. His best thought on this score is in the essay, Faith for a Lenten Age, which he wrote for time. In the essay, he explores the writings of Fyodor Dostoevsky, Soren Kierkegaard, Karl Barth, and Reinhold Niebuhr. 
he explored the common recognition in these authors of man's dichotomies and the resultant existential torment that they entail. Chambers juxtaposed their rather tragic view of man with the understanding of modern liberalism. He quoted Reinhold Niebuhr to sum the anthropology of modern liberalism. Quote, supposing himself more and more to be the measure of all things, he achieved a singularly easy conscience and an almost hermetically smug optimism. The idea that man is sinful and needs redemption was subtly changed into the idea that man is by nature good and hence capable of indefinite perfectibility. Man is essentially good, says 20th century liberalism, because he is rational. And his rationality is, if he happens to be a liberal Protestant, divine. Or if he happens to be religiously unattached, at least benign, end quote. Believing himself beyond original sin, convinced by his own illusions of his project's imminent goodness, modern man rushed towards his doom. He became blind to the evils in front of him, Chambers believed. For Chambers, this idea, this attitude was disastrous because it tended toward an anti-theist and ultimately anti-human humanism. Thus, modern liberalism posed no direct challenge to the quest for ideological certainty, the preeminent sin of the 20th century. Indeed, modern liberalism was deeply implicated in this ideological quest. Chambers argued that ideology is at bottom an artifice of mind that attempts to construct upon reality an encompassing system that removes man from his inherent existential limitedness. Ideological man is a denatured man who assumes godlike status, projecting truth on empty matter, demanding its transformation. Thus, ideology compels obedience, Chambers said, from all competing explanations. Chambers, I think, correctly observed that ideology is the effectual truth of our modern desiccated humanism. His judgment was certain. There were no Promethean shortcuts. But if the culmination of the West's flattened humanism was ideology, what were the prospects for its ascendant progressive politics? Chambers saw the political vision of American progressives as resting ultimately on faith, faith in many of the same ideals held by socialists. So when he noted and witnessed that, quote, when I took up my little sling and aimed at communism, I also hit something else. What I hit was the forces of that great socialist revolution, which in the name of liberalism, spasmodically, incompletely, somewhat formlessly, but always in the same direction, has been inching its ice cap over the nation for two decades. He was elaborating that this was really the revolution he hit when he strikes at Hiss. And this is the reason why, in many respects, he thinks he has to be uh, destroyed by his opponents. The point of Chambers' observation, though, is not that the New Deal was synonymous with communist subversion, but that its political ideas emanate from the same unbounded confidence in state power. While not intending to derail the purity of modern liberalism, Chambers' indictment of Alger Hiss served notice to America that pride and venality lurked within a political program that believed itself in many respects beyond the compromises and temptations of power in politics. Further, these perennial problems of power were magnified by a movement that really, that, that really saw power, uh, magnified power, and what it wanted to do with the state made these ideals and made its innocence uh, so dangerous. Fidelity to the ideals of progressivism was said to be enough. It was this innocence of progressive self-understanding that Chambers shattered and is also why he had to be resisted, if not destroyed. This confidence in state power to shape and determine man is one part of the hyper-rationalist mind that Chambers was at war with in his, written, in his witness and writings. This is the vital philosophical connection between modern liberalism and communism for Chambers. As Diana Trilling stated in her memorable essay, a memorandum on the Hiss case, I think we can also say that in our century, the source of all political idealism has been socialism. And since the Russian Revolution, specifically the socialism of the Soviet Union. I do not mean that whoever has worked for political progress has necessarily been a socialist. I mean only that it has been from socialist theory that political progress has chiefly taken its inspiration and from the socialist example, its practice, end quote. For Chambers and conservatives of his era, the lines of political and philosophical engagement were never more clearly stated. Chambers' conservatism fully emerged in the exile, I think, in his self-imposed exile, years after the Hiss case. It is worth noting that he really shared 
few of the certainties that American conservatives typically hold. Chambers never looked to markets or small governments as self-executing entities that would exist apart from the travails of the period, the travails of democratic man, and deliver unparalleled happiness. This is evident in his reluctance, I think, to join National Review initially. Uh, Chambers thought the conservatism being pursued by National Review was really unable uh, to secure anything like a majority in a mass democracy. He thought that Frank Meyer, Frank Chodorov, and Russell Kirk, these early conservative and libertarian lions, were too abstract from political realities. Their platonic conservatism wanted to roll back the state, undo the New Deal, and return to another era. In the case of Russell Kirk, perhaps another country and another century. Chambers was more political. For Chambers, politics is an attempt to think coherently about the goods put in common and how we might augment them or, def or defend them. This sounds innocuous, but Chambers was stating to American conservatives that the ideals, habits, and institutions of the late modern era already foreclosed opportunities that were available to them just decades ago. The new reality that confronted conservatives was democracy and its ever-widening equality of conditions. As Chambers remarked to William Buckley, quote, the Enlightenment has happened. Conservatives will have to adjust. Chambers articulated that the conservative position defends and invokes those great truths which the mind of the West has once for all disclosed. But what does this mean exactly? If, as Chambers stated, each age finds its own language for an eternal meaning, then conservatism, by definition, has no formulaic task. From an awareness of the good emerges coherent thought about the means of politics toward affirming the rightful ends of political association. Further complicating matters for conservatives was the Razor Wire Act thrust upon them by history, Chambers held. He stated as follows, those who remain in the world, if they will not surrender on its terms, must maneuver within its terms. That is what conservatives must decide, how much to give in order to survive at all, how much to give in order not to give up the basic principles. And of course, that results in a dance along a precipice. Chambers' concerns evoke the fundamental tensions introduced by modernity and capitalism's breathless acceleration, as he termed it, and the fallout introduced by the latter's creative destruction. Chambers noted capitalism produced the Cadillac, but it also stirred up the passions where, quote, the Cadillac dangles always just out of reach at the end of the stick. His highly critical review of Ludwig von Mises, the anti-capitalist mentality, pointed to the dramatic shortcoming of a civilization animated by materialism and its inability to generate the necessary moral preconditions, serving uh, as, as the undergirding foundation of limited government and free markets. Mises' arguments amounted, Chambers said, to a know-nothing conservatism, because he ignored the deeper moral quality that hid behind envy, and which sought firmer ground within the unsettling tendencies of modernity. Prosperity now seemed the default state of man's existence. Its denial, its lack of, of being evident, was something that had to be corrected, Chambers, Chambers believed, that, that most of his uh, fellow citizens thought, and the state naturally rushed in to fill the void. So he didn't really think that there were a lot of options for conservatives in that regard. The task was really to speak to that anxiety of democratic man and elevate and focus his thoughts on firmer ground. So I think his, pessim his pessimism continues to hold here. In the socialist agriculture essays, Chambers noted that the conflicting sentiments of hate and need that were felt by his fellow Maryland farmers towards federal and state uh, intervention policies were largely contradictory. After all, they really couldn't stay in business without these policies. Uh, and so, in large respect, their taking uh, of the support checks from the government, which kept them in business, which kept the farms operating, uh, largely meant that their anti-government resistance didn't amount to much. Chambers cited the futility of their, of their resistance by citing Lenin. Quote, he who says A must say B. The farmers no longer held their authority to resist state intervention. It was here, at the intersection of frustration, made possible by the proficiency of capitalism and the low arts of democracy that Chambers pointed to as an invariable trap for conservatives. He was less than sanguine that there were any real positive alternatives for the conservative movement. And this is not a limited example. Obviously, this remains uh, a problem for conservatism today. His famous conversion from communism to Christianity and Chambers' witness to truth in the early Cold War period were made possible because Chambers 
wrestled with the question modern rationalism was unable to pose to itself. What can be hoped for with this life? And the opportunity for transcendence and need felt by every man exists the possibility for man to finally understand himself. This is what Chambers teaches us. He can be himself again. Politics can now be just politics. Economics can now be just economics. Chambers knew that the answer could not be found in our banal humanism. So his witness, along with the witnesses of men like Alexander Solzhenitsyn or John Paul II, continues to haunt us with the implications resulting from our own splits of liberty and truth and faith and reason. So yes, the West won the Cold War. Chambers was wrong. Free markets, property rights, limited government, and civil society are more conducive to prosperity than anything that can be achieved by centralized planning. Even our president understands this, if only through a glass darkly. Less evident are the pre-political requirements necessary to make these goods an enduring reality. This is the source, I think, of Chambers' ongoing relevance to our situation. We still accept this legacy from the Enlightenment that we make our own reality. We are not subject to nature. Communism, while it stands discredited, its philosophical confusion, the philosophical confusion, confusion from which it launched, I think, remains too much with us. Our conception of liberty firmly resists the notions Chambers articulated of the biblical understanding of man, or similarly, an understanding of liberty that it be oriented to truth, which faith and reason might know in their various capacities. Liberty in our time is synonymous with the desires of man's subjective will. So, I would contend we are now on the backside, in many respects, of the failure of Enlightenment rationalism. We search for a way to ground our being in ideology and politics, and yet I think there is an awareness that we can't go on this way for much longer. Chambers' distasteful pessimism might be something we should relocate and relearn. So I'll end with the following questions for a, a triumphant Western civilization, and, and pardon the pessimism. Uh, what are the implications of our coming demographic winter? Why are Western democracies, our country included, unable to even take the sensible steps of shoring up the natural family? Why do we exalt a transnational humanism, supposedly guaranteed by international treaties and law, to the detriment of our own political sovereignty? What are we trying to avoid? Why are we inept in actually facing the Islamic nations who mean to kill us? What is, and this might be more of a European consideration, but why are European nations so fearful of and even hateful towards Israel? As Pierre Manault has suggested, is it because Israel in its political and military sovereignty asks Europe for its name, a name that the nations of Europe are no longer sure of and no longer able to give? Hence, their communion is lost. These basic problems, and there are many more, telegraph our political and philosophical impotence, the weaknesses that Chambers identified. So Chambers' witness still haunts us, and we forget him at our peril. That may very well be one of the most brilliant lectures that we've had here in Heritage in a long, long, long time. <laughs> one, one of the possible uh, fun place to go for answers is, uh, of course, the, the little plug for the home team here, and that is the Heritage Foundation with its emphasis on what? First principles and going back to the Constitution and how important and what the lessons that we can draw from that to come up with solutions for America. Uh, having given that plug, please, I want to open it up to questions from you all, please, who would like to, to begin. Yes, sir. Thank you. If you, uh, we can consider today that the Islamism nation that has replaced the communism if you had today uh, Chambers, what main point would he, would, would he address about this question? Well, I, I mean, I look at the, I look at the, you know, the Islamic movement uh, largely globally. If that, if I understand your question correctly, I mean, I think if we, you know, if we look at you would say Nazism, right? I mean, if you're in the Aryan race then there are potentially a lot of goods for you to gain by becoming a Nazi. If you're outside, you're largely out of luck. I mean, you're going to be killed or imprisoned. It's, I mean, it's a bad deal. For only, it's a good deal for only a, a small portion of people. Communism, 
is very different. Uh, it's, it's like Christianity, right? It's universal. It's open to everyone. You just have to accept these central tenets and this kind of teleological understanding of history. Uh, so potentially the benefits are wide and diffuse. Uh, and as Chambers said, they ignite men's faith. Uh, men actually learn to believe again. And, th and they realize the power in this. This is something that had been forgotten. I think Islam, uh, I think, may fall more in the, in, the, in, the, in the allure of Nazism in the sense of Oh, I don't think it has uh, an appeal um, uh, that is that is as alluring as communism, which is not to say that it isn't a growing movement. Oh, and obviously it is. It's not to say that it's not a religion on the march. It obviously is. They still believe in their tenets and, and are willing to fight for them and die for them. And I think largely this is also, you know, caught up in what uh, you know Father Shaw talks about with their understanding of God and the sovereignty of God and what he demands of the follower, which I think is quite is quite radical and it's very different from Christianity. Uh, so I, I think the answer is probably yes and no, um, uh, but I, you know, I think largely you know, the question uh, for us is, you know, they take advantage of our own political correctness, and, but, and why are we? But why is the political correctness largely a fence to clear and coherent thinking about this potential, this this real enemy? Uh, and that's and that's the problem that that exists for us, I think. You see Chambers' all-out attack on Atlas Shrugged as sort of a stand-in in, in those days for what has developed in the ensuing decades in the friction that has developed between economic and social conservatives, notwithstanding the fact that they both upheld the Reagan presidency, for example. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, largely, uh, you know, a problem within the American right is that groups will cohere largely for, uh, out of the rationale of an external enemy. I mean, that's largely what has held the right together. Um, uh, so the, the infighting, I think, is, and, and as it's become more pronounced, was bound to happen, uh, because largely we're talking about different principles. And this really gets to Chambers' review of Rand. I mean, you know, Chambers says, you know, this is a heresy, but it's a heresy in the traditional sense. It's not that it's wholly wrong, but it's that what it actually gets right comes at the expense of other truths and actually perverts other uh, good understandings. And so, you know, for Chambers, one of the things he remarks about in the review is that there's just this rational egoism. You know, what, what Rand wants to construct is this autonomous or this state or, you know, order of autonomous beings uh, living apart from one another, connected only by contracts. Uh, for, you know, Chambers notes the, you know, the prevalence of sex in the novel but yet there seems to be uh, you know, nothing like marriage. There's nothing like children. So what are we up to here? What type of man are you trying to build and construct? And this is, I think, where he locates the ideological turn in Rand's writing. Plus, I mean, Chambers is a brilliant writer. Uh, and I think if, if Chambers doesn't go underground in 1932, he's one of the great American writers of the 20th century, he thinks Rand is just is a bad stylist. Uh, and he remarks upon this at length. You kind of alluded to my, my question. I have two questions. One is, can you elaborate as to what factions or parts of the conservative movement oppose Chambers' message and Chambers? And the other question is, what would you think Chambers would recommend to be uh, incorporated in the conservative message that would address this spiritual shortcoming that we have in the conservative movement? Okay. Well, I think largely, you know, when I, uh, and I talk about this in the opening chapter, but if you look at how the conservative movement, I think, now looks back upon the Cold War, and, and you know, Lee and, and others would be accepted out of this, but it's, it's almost a Marxist understanding of history. It's, we could not lose to communism. You know, communism could not beat us. We know because free markets are right, and there's no way we could lose. Uh, I think this is foolish. Uh, and, and I think this largely betrays a certain economic ideology within uh, conservatism uh, that, that largely misses the intricate realities uh, that are at play in any political situation. As, as far as within the conservative movement, you know, it's not that anyone directly opposes Chambers. I mean, you know, Chambers is not, uh, I mean, in doing the research for this book, I mean, the, the number of people who write about him regularly is fairly small uh, in terms of him, you know, and, and because he's not directly applicable to maybe political realities in real time. Uh, but I think it is largely, uh, you know, something we were talking about earlier, it is, it's this understanding that man uh, exists for his own purposes. 
that man is sovereign over all, that there is nothing above his will that he's accountable to, that he has to appeal to. Uh, so if you think about, we were talking about this earlier, think about Buckley and his conversation with Rand. She says, reportedly, you're too intelligent to believe in God. Uh, well, I mean, what, what are we getting at there? And I think that's what Chambers is, is pointing at in, in many respects. Um, uh, you know, that in many ways, if we lose that side, if we, if we see man making his bed here alone, uh, then we're setting ourselves up for ideology. We set ourselves up to turn each other into opposing camps and to try and articulate a, an over, you know, an encompassing good uh, for this world. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Um, as you describe it, Chambers really emphasizes, it sounded like, the theistic foundations for these pre-political goods <coughs> and virtues that are the foundation for everything else. What did he say then and what would he say now to citizens and persons who have a holistic view of man and don't just believe in economic man as I think Robert mm -hmm. Miller just described in the National Affairs article recently. You know, have a holistic view, um, but they don't want to ground it theistically or they're not mm -hmm. as comfortable doing that. Is there a compromise there? What would he say? Well, I don't, I mean, you know, Chambers, you know, I mean, interesting part of Chambers in doing the research for the book, he really stands within no orthodoxy, political or religious. Um, you know, he's largely, even as Christianity, it's an existential Christianity. It is, it is a total Christianity that, you know, as a Kierkegaard uh, defended and outlined, of the complete surrender to the self, uh, and, and, and maybe what's happening around you is unreasonable and you can't make sense of it, but yet you will leap in uh, with your whole person and try and try and affect the good. Uh, so I, I don't know, uh, from Chambers, you know, he doesn't really give us a lot of counsel for, say, like a natural right conservatism or you know, something like a classical natural law position. Uh, but th that is not to say also when he's writing about conversion, or he's writing about his own conversion, you know, it is largely an account of man that is you know, very, you know, that, that is synonymous with, with something that, you know, a natural right thinker might espouse. Uh, uh, but that's, you know, I, but I, I don't know. I mean, he doesn't really offer much in that regard. But I think teasing that together. This is kind of a follow-on to what you just said, but first, thank you for a, a very fine presentation. Uh, could you give us any hints, or does Chamber give us any hints as to not why he left communism, but the kind of things that prompted him to embrace Christianity. Books, ideas, people, any specific experiences, or was it just a long, slow, kind of drip, drip, drip kind of pilgrimage? And no. Then, then you also elaborated a little bit that he wasn't an orthodox, mm -hmm. um, creedal, denominational Christian, but if you could... Yeah. If if his movement toward Christianity explains any of that too. Well, I think you know, when Chambers commits to communism, I mean, what's very revealing about his communism are these four short stories he writes for the new masses in the 1920s when he's known as the hottest literary Bolshevik uh, uh, writing in America. Um, and these four short stories, these are you know people under great distress uh, who largely overcome through heroic virtue and courage sacrifice uh, these situations they're thrust into and achieve something like not victory but just kind of the the triumph of the human spirit so he doesn't even in these essays when he's writing about communist victory or you know strength of communist thought he doesn't appeal to dialectical materialism you know he's not he's not appealing to the actual kind of intricate ideological parts of communism he's appealing to the the nobility of the human spirit in a lot of ways it's kind of you know strange I mean what you know if you were reading this and you were in the movement I mean, it had to have you know, struck people funny, but of course, you know, one of his plays did very well. Uh, it was actually performed across uh, uh, on the Bolshevik theater. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I think thinking about that, he largely looks at this total commitment he's made to communism in light of what he believes is the brokenness of the modern world, and he begins to see that's a lie, and he begins to see what he's embraced is is wrong. Um, but unlike a lot of people who leave communism, it's not for a, a lesser form of leftism that he jumps into. He says, this is all wrong. I've embraced this completely, and look what it's doing. So the Stalinist purges are a huge part of his learning. And also, he's watching people being called back uh, to Russia, and, they're not, and they're, no one's hearing from them again. So he's, he's directly experienced them. He himself was asked to come back. 
uh, to, to, to the Soviet Union. And he had been a deviationist of sorts in the late 1920s within the American Communist Party. So I think this jolts him and, and largely sets him to thinking, you know, well, where should I turn now? What should I look for? Because he still believes there is just a brokenness about him in late modernity. Uh, and he, I think, you know, the Quaker faith made sense for him because the quiet meeting allowed for this type of, you know, existential gathering in and, you know, spiritual slow conversion that he was seeking. Um, uh, but, you know, his writing about Christianity is, and it is, it is uh, Augustinian-like. I mean, Augustine leaves Manichaean thought. Uh, Chambers will leave what he says the hyper-rationalist mind that has, you know, largely enshrouded him with lies, and he, he's stripping this off and embracing who he really is, who he was designed to be. So it's, you know, it's that type of a Christian commitment he makes. Uh, thanks for that great presentation. Um, a couple of years ago, I read a biography of Whittaker Chambers by Samuel Tannenhaus. And at the time, I thought it was a really great book, a very insightful book. But some years later, Tannenhaus came out with what I thought was a really stupid critique of conservatism, saying conservatism was finished, saying sort of a, uh, embracing Obama progressivism. And then I thought, is it possible that the same person who wrote such a sympathetic and brilliant biography of, of Chambers could, could then turn around and, and sort of lose his marbles? So, 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 so my question to you is, what do you think of Tannenhaus's book, and, and, and do you have any thoughts well, on it? Funny that? you should ask. I have, a, I have an essay coming out about uh, Tannenhaus's conservat uh, seeming conservative. Be careful now your answer if you hope to get reviewed in the New York Times. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I, I don't. <laughs> Well, I mean, if, if he was to review it, it would get mangled by a leftist, I think. But uh, uh, you know, when I read uh, Tannenhaus's book, um, you know, Conservatism is Dead, I mean, largely, what is his philosophical project? And it's largely, I think, you know, America is fundamentally a progressive nation. And what's the duty of conservatives? We need you from time to time to talk about responsibility, to talk about civic goods, uh, to talk about you know, the, the need for government to actually be accountable. We need you to do that. But you're an accommodationist for us. You help us adjust to the momentous strides we push the nation towards. And then, then he enlists Chambers in this, uh, largely for the reasons that you know, Chambers' essay and correspondence, you know, after, after the trial, you know, he tries to make Chambers into this. Uh, it's kind of a, a conservative that would agree with him uh, who would understand these kind of breathless forces. Uh, and in a certain sense, Chambers does understand the forces. He doesn't say you wield to them, but he's also saying that politics isn't going to solve all of your problems, and what you really have to do is articulate something else, you know, something true about man. Uh, but don't look to politics or economics to solve all your problems. As Chambers counsel, but, you know, Chambers understands, you know, you know what Harvey Mansfield talks about. You know, democracy democratizes everything. He understands what the Enlightenment really means in real time, and he is counseling, I think, conservatism, create spaces for liberty. You know, Chambers talks about the Taft-Hartley Act. He loved the Taft-Hartley Act. Why? Because you still had in certain states mobility of contract, mobility of labor. And, right, and, then, and in time, you could represent these aspects of markets to other people, even though Michigan or Ohio, they're going to go their own way and let them. Uh, but this is what conservatism can do, create these spaces you know, for flourishing still to happen. Good afternoon. I'd like to ask a bit of an opposite question to the one that was asked earlier about uh, Chambers' conversion to Christianity, mm -hmm. which is his conversion to communism. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to the reference earlier to Sam Tannenhaus's uh, biography, um, I don't remember whether it was Mark Van Doren or Lionel Trilling, but one of the two said that Whitaker Chambers was the most brilliant student uh, he had ever had, which is quite a statement. Yeah, it would have been Mark Van Doren. Mark Van Doren. Because Lionel, they were cla trilling in chambers, were classmates. Right. I see, I'm yeah. sorry, right. Yeah. Um, but the, the heart of my question is, um, for chambers, was it largely an intellectual conversion to communism? I mean, in other words, what were the roots and the genesis of such a brilliant but, mm -hmm. you know, very troubled young man? Um, what, what would actually cause him uh, to, to embrace communism? What, what are its seeds? Well, indeed, and, and that's a question that, that we could pose uh, maybe to the entire, you know, the, the intellectual class of the 19, you know, really the 1930s, uh, preceding that somewhat. Um, 
You know, in Chambers, you know, he ranges on this. He discusses this in Witness. You know, he says, one of the things he talks about uh, in Witness, uh, a man who means a lot to him is this, um, uh, he's a communist figure. He's in America. He lives in New York. And, and Chambers says, you know, his apartment is a 20th century monk's cell. That is a communist cell. And he loves this man's discipline, his study, the way he, you know, works for communism here in America. And he finds this to be convincing and this to actually you know, provide man with a surety and a certainty that he no longer has you know, within the, in, the, in the early 20th century. Uh, that to me is, is a, crucial, a crucial reason why Chambers becomes communism, becomes a communist, I should say, because of, you know, it, it, Chambers says it, invite, it invites man uh, in the four ways that he's always redeemed himself. Suffering, patience, trial, discipline, these things. This is what he looks to. Um, so it's, it's that, I mean, it, it's an existential movement. It is an attempt to complete his being, I think, by becoming a communist. But he's also willing to rethink it all. Uh, but, you know, the question is, why do so many people of, of intellectual probity, of sensitivity, of pedigree and learning become communists? Mm -hmm. And Chambers says, you know, he says, you know, the great phrase, uh, you know, they learn to believe again. They learn to have faith. So. <laughs> Excuse me, not to cut off, but just I might add right there that for those of you who have not read The God That Failed, it's a very important book. And I think it's a, wouldn't you agree, yeah. Richard, a compliment to, to all that we're talking about here and now. The God That Failed, published in the early 1950s, a, it's a story of six very prominent Western intellectuals, including an American and an Italian and a Frenchman, Andre Sheed, the Nobel laureate, and so forth why they became communists and then why they became anti-communists and for them this idea they looked upon communism as a as, as a god as mm -hmm. a giving them purpose mm -hmm. so excuse me if i just but this occurred to me yeah just in following up on the previous questions i remember from witness what whitaker chambers said is when he went to columbia university that's where he got led to communism basically <laughs> and it was his experience well but you know he says is what precedes that is really kind of a philosophical relativism and he says, my, you know, I realize my, because he's, he's actually, he likes Calvin Coolidge. He has a letter writing campaign for Calvin Coolidge when he's at Columbia. And he, you know, he lists himself as, uh, you know, something of a conservative. But he says, my, I realized in conversations with Mark Van Doren that my intellectual shirt tails were showing. Uh, and, he, and I think he largely, that's when he begins this movement of change. He doesn't long, you know, kind of stay in this indeterminate state, but quickly moves towards leftism. Anyway, my, my question, maybe you're, book will stimulate a revived interest in Chambers, but is, is there anybody, or maybe you could be doing it, is working on collecting his essays together from National Review, Time Magazine, and elsewhere, and putting them together in a book, or no, somebody no. else doing maybe a, a motion picture on his life, which would seem like DVD was... Stupid. I like the motion picture idea. No, uh, the, uh, uh, Terry Teachout, who's uh, the culture editor uh, for a commentary magazine, put together his journalism in a collection called Ghost on the Roof in 1994, which I draw from heavily in my book. Yes, please. Any, any other questions? Well, I'm sure there are. Yes, please. Um, just a bit back to uh, Sam Tannenhaus' uh, book. Uh, I, I know Chambers basically through this book. Uh, a question, was it, is it a fair account? Or, an, uh, oh, I, and I never read Witness. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend that I read Witness? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, but was Stanton House? I mean, I had a fairly good impression to, and, and feel for Chambers just for this book. So. Uh, well, I, I mean, it's not it's not that Tannen House is wholly wrong. I think in the way he uses Chambers, uh, but I think he's using him for a larger philosophical project that Chambers didn't share, and he wants to use him in support of that. And I think there he goes wrong, and he makes too much of but is really the, the virtue of prudence that Chambers is exhibiting and wisdom and political maneuvering. And he wants to turn him into, you know, kind of something like you know, a neo-progressive early 70s thinker. Something like, you know, I don't know, maybe something like Daniel Bell or a neoconservative thinker like that, maybe. Or working. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all.